Greetings and welcome to Revna Den. I'm Michael Hasenfang and this is episode 13, The Reason for Communion, which falls on the heels of last episode, which was the days of Noah the Return and also the days of Elijah the Three. And I did a little uh, tidbit section in there, which was also explaining the days of Joel, which is uh, darkness before the light and what's going to happen within, I'd say, probably these coming days, not just like literally as in like a couple days could, but um, within our lifetime, it's it's like now, it's a now season that this is going to be happening where we're going to be seeing all these things come into play with how the days of Elijah is um, pretty much today with the ball worship and the enchantress and Moloch we see the destruction of the government system and then the lewd perverse sexual behaviors which we have uh, followed by abortion and the destruction in the, of the family um, we also see in the days of Noah how we go into the Nephilim and the mighty men of old but how Satan uses not just them but any means to corrupt and perverse the human lineage, which is uh, through uh, these hybrid forms um, or the AI system, which we're seeing today with the implantations of these chips into our brains and entering into this uh, secondary universe, if you will. It's like uh, Sims or Second Second Life, stuff like that, where we're going to be implanted into the system or what people are trying to aim for. And the days of Joel is God's response to how we are acting today. And how he is getting the world to try and pretty much bring the earth to its knees by shaking it and having the world repent and bring themselves back into God, at which we will usher in this kingdom age, supposedly, from what the prophets say. And I'm still in agreement with that. Um, it is troublesome, I think, for a lot of us who do believe this, um, because we take it from both sides. You know, we, we take it from the enemy side as... You know, we're, we're constantly being mocked and ridiculed and persecuted. And then also with the brethren who don't believe it or the rest of the world who is not woken up to what is happening right now. They don't believe the prophets. They think uh, many of us who are in agreement with us are just crazy and losing our minds. And there's no such thing as a kingdom age. But it seems that the more that gets unraveled through these prophetic words that tie in biblically to the accounts within scripture, it, it seems to be matching up fairly good. And we are now going to be going into the aspects of communion, which is how the body remembers Christ's sacrifice for us uh, and what communion also entails. Now being raised a Catholic, obviously communion was a sacrament. I'm sure it's a sacrament to many denominations out there. It's well, probably the main one that they all partake in uh, the most. And I, I was one who never really believed too much in the process of transubstantiation as the Catholics do, which means that once you take the blood and body of Christ, that it turns into literally the blood and body of Christ within your body. There's, there's a, few, a few issues with that. And I'm going to bring up today, and it's it's not that I don't believe in transubstantiation, but it's it's in a different means, and I think the Catholics would believe in it, and probably different than a lot of denominations would believe in it. They'd probably look at me and think that I'm just as out there as the Catholics are in this subject matter. But um, I, I think. I think the topic of the communion is going to be rather short. I'm going to sort of branch out into different subjects in this episode, but try and tie it all in at the end. And so this may be a relatively short episode. Um, I mean, but it, it might also be long in the aspect that I'm going to be going different routes. And like I said in the previous episode, I don't know if this is going to be five minutes or five hours. So... I'm just going to run with it and see what happens. I've been to many different churches. Uh, again, I was raised Catholic, but in my teens or early 20s, I sort of had a bit of a falling out and dabbled into all sorts of weird things like the dark arts, stuff like that. Um, something that I'm not really proud of, but I think the experience in the end drew me closer to God because it did give me sort of this 
uh, branching out to experience the evil in the world and from that evil uh, is where I've actually came to Christ. And <clears throat> since then, I've been trying to hone in reading different theologians, going to different churches, checking out different sermons, listening to different people's topics and doctrines of faith. And I've noticed that when it came to communion, um, for the most part, they're more or less on par, but it is very, very diverse. Um, obviously, the Catholics have it every Sunday, if not more, if you're partaking in different, uh, different like night masses, things like that. Um, there's some churches that do it uh, once a month. There's other churches that may just end up doing it, say, um, annually or semi-annually, like maybe they literally do it at the Lord's Supper during Passover, and that's when they do it. That's when they get together for communion. Um, there's some people uh, like myself and other prophets who have been trying to take it every day. There's days where I just forget uh, or I just don't have enough. Like after this one, I'm down to my last two. And I said that I would move to wine this time. There is a store that I was going to go to, but I haven't had time this week. And if I'm lucky, maybe I'll be able to go there today. But uh, I'm doing this video first, so I might as well just use up what I have. I do want to start moving to actual Eucharist wafers and wine. I'll get to those reasons why in just a sec as well, too. <clears throat> but for the most part... The doctrine of faith in any denomination within how uh, we are to do communion or the reasons why we do communion are pretty much the same. I mean, they're scripturally accurate. There's Bible verses all over the place that pretty much point to the reasons why we do it. And I'm going to explain the three triangle <laughs> reason why we do communion for the most part that almost every single denomination has. <clears throat> the first one is for the remembrance of Jesus. Now, this is this is probably the most pivotal thing on why we do communion as the body of Christ. It is for the remembrance of what he did. We are remembering his death for us, that he died for us, but also rose again on the third day. He is now ascended and seated at the right hand of the Father. Um, as many of the creeds say, you know, you will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end forever and ever and ever. Um, we do this as a, as a, just a remembrance of Jesus's death. Because part of that fulfillment of the scriptures that he also rose from the dead as well too, was his sacrifice to us in that uh, he died for our sins so that we can attain heaven just as he did after he rose from the grave. Um, not to say that Jesus wasn't in heaven before then. He is part of the Father. He's part of the triune God. He came down from heaven to be a man and die as our kinsman redeemer for us. The thing with the Old Testament <clears throat> and having animals be slain on the mercy seat, passing the sin, say, onto the bull, um, to have its throat cut and have the blood spill on the mercy seat for the atonement of your sins was only symbolic for Christ because we were sacrificing animals and animals were finite. They were a finite creation. They were created by God. They weren't the true sacrificial means to our ends because in order for us and all of mankind to have eternal forgiveness and eternal salvation and eternal redemption from our sins. We needed to have an eternal being come down. Someone who was outside of our realm, that was outside of the finite, to come down in his infinite being, his infinite majesty and his power and to, as man and as God in one, I know there's many different um, doctrines of faith or, you know, like sex where Jesus was, you know, fully man or he was fully God, but he was never the two or he was, you know, when he, when he, he was born man, but then became God. And there's this whole bunch of just 
all sorts of stuff. Now he was he was fully man and he was fully God. You had to have two in the same measure at the same time for this to be a fulfillment of this prophecy and for us to have salvation because if he was one or the other, we're still left within our sins. You need to have an infinite eternal being of supreme power come down and cloak himself, embody himself as a man so that we have a kinsman redeemer who sacrificed himself for us. And now, since he was part of our being, of our human mankind, but also the eternal sacrifice, once he died on the cross, that sacrifice is eternal. It's forever, and it's for everyone. It stretches out to all creation throughout all time, even previous to Christ's death. Uh, <clears throat> and it goes until the end of time. So this is why Jesus came down for us. And there, I, I can't remember who it was. Which theologian spoke this? It might not even have been. It could have been just a pastor. It was, it was somebody I heard years ago mention this and i believe it was my pastor jeff solwood in madison wisconsin at the time who described it and i could be wrong on that so if i'm quoting you wrong jeff sorry but this is where I, I feel that i got it from is that and i'm not trying to say this in a rude or mean way or in a way to mock god uh, i'm just giving sort of an analogy is that let's say that uh, a human came down to live with dogs and he embodied himself as this dog to sacrifice himself for the benefit of all dogs throughout all times so they will be able to go to dog heaven you know they're they're part of the family of humans now <clears throat> the thing is is that when this human came down as a dog and sacrificed himself for these dogs when he rose again to have that fulfillment for all dog kind throughout all of eternity, past, present, future, uh, throughout all spans of time, he had to remain a dog. So whatever he was in human form previously is now embodied or bottled up almost kind of in a sense. I don't want to say a genie in a bottle because that's not what God is, but I'm just giving, again, just an, a symbolism to it where he would be embodied in this dog throughout all eternity forever and ever what he was previously is not how he looks or, or what he was in relationship to his father at that time if this makes sense so whatever jesus was whatever the the triune godhead was at that time with father son holy spirit the embodiment that he had at that time once he came down to be in human form and die for us and when he rose up in his glorified human body that's now the body that he's going to have for the rest of his life forever and ever and ever because he is our kinsman redeemer whatever previous union he had with the father is now gone and they are back in relationship to again you know jesus is seated at the right hand of the father but he doesn't have the full like potential of what his son his his unified relationship he had with his father was this is what it means when they say that jesus died that he sacrificed himself it wasn't that he just died for a couple days and god was like okay i'm just gonna raise him up you know uh like i did lazarus you know and then we're just back you know yeah you were gone for a few days you know you're you're, you're back everything's fine again it's whatever relationship they had previously to him coming to earth and whatever he was prior to the creation um is now embodied in this human form and that's how he's going to look throughout all of eternity so it, it was it was a sacrifice that is held up even to this day of the relationship that he had with his father and this is what um bonhoeffer was um proclaiming when he wrote costly grace that anything that's costly to the lord should not be taken lightly to us it cost him everything it cost him his son like he literally died that day from whatever he was to become what he is now and make us his kinsman redeemer that shows us how much love he had for his creation and for the people here on earth 
So we do this in remembrance of his sacrifice, but also his resurrection of what he became, of what he came down to earth to be die for us and then be risen again into this new glorified human body. But it's still, he's, he's a human throughout all of eternity. There is a human seated at the right hand of God, pretty much is the point I'm trying to make. It's not like God, you know, all powerful, all encompassing, you know, unification that they had with the Holy Spirit and the Father back in, you know, before he came down. It's it's now a human being sitting at the right hand of the Father. And yes, all power and glory and authority has been passed to him. Again, as if the Lord was taking his signet ring, you know, and passing it to his son and saying, you are now in charge um, over all creation. Yes, we take it in remembrance of him. We also take it, second part, in anticipation of what he proclaimed to do, where he said, you know, this is, this is my blood, the new, blood of the new and everlasting covenant. Take this, you know, uh, so that uh, your sins may be forgiven. But he also said that he will not partake of this new wine until we are all together in the new kingdom of God which means he's not drinking any wine up in heaven, I guess. He won't partake in this communion with us, uh, with the celebration of life in this wine, until we are united with him. Now, there's some people who kind of mix up a bit, if you will, wine and grape juice. And I don't think it's really that big of a deal whether you drink wine or whether you drink grape juice. There's some people that just won't touch it at all and think it's just a horrific, sinful act. But you got to remember, the first thing that Jesus did, the first miracle he performed was the water into wine, and that was at a Canaan wedding. Now, Canaan weddings, whether you know it or not, went on for about seven days straight, all right? There was just part partying, celebrations, there was uh, festivities going on just nonstop for seven days. Now, I don't care what you believe. If you want to drink grape juice, that's fine. But there is no way under the sun in any way, shape, or form you are going to convince me that grown men went to a wedding celebration for seven days and drank grape juice. I'm sorry, you are not convincing me of that ever. Ever. There's no way you're convincing me that they drank grape juice for seven days straight and no wine for a festivity, a giant celebration, a giant wedding feast. No, no. Sorry, Kent Hovind once said that when Jesus did the miracle <clears throat> where he turned uh, water into wine, he's like, where's a fermentation process? And I'm just like, dude, where's the grape process? You know, God can create grape and make grape juice, but fermentation a little too high on his power scale there? He can't pull that one off? No, I think he can. Problem is, is that when Jesus turned the water into wine, and I think both sides are right, whether it's grape juice or whether it was wine that ran out, doesn't matter because Cat Care, uh, if you believe her, she's a prophetess where uh, she's been taken to heaven on many occasions. She says that the, the wine that Jesus produced was the new wine, was this spiritual wine. It was infused not with alcohol, but with the Holy Spirit. And that's why when people took it at the, the wedding, they were just like, this is the best wine I ever had in my life. You know, they, they were just captivated by it. I'm sorry, no one ever says that with grape juice. Okay, no one, this is the best grape juice I ever had in my life, right? Oh, okay, was there a... You know, finger painting and macaroni doodles also at this wedding celebration. It's like, come on, guys. You know, there's festivities. Let's let's liven the mood a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and though alcohol, I think, does in mass quantities bring out um, the true self, like it removes the mask of our demeanor of who we are in public and it brings out how we really are deep down inside that's why it's called spirits it's incorporating it's bringing out you and if you drink alcohol too much and you become just a raging belligerent violent it almost seems like that is your true self from due to past experiences um bad trauma <clears throat> you know just certain issues that you can't get off your chest <coughs> excuse me and if you're that type of person and you drink and you can't handle your alcohol, then yes, don't drink.
okay? There is a corruption within that. My wife wants me to go out and have a beer or two or have like a couple drinks, not get totally ripped, but just have enough to become just open up to the intoxication of the alcohol because it makes me more friendly, makes me more open, it makes me more happy, it makes me more cheerful, it makes me a bit more flirtatious, makes me a bit more adventurous and energetic, to be honest. I'm not so just staunch and stoic and just, you know, straight faced as many people see me when I'm out in public. If I go out drinking, I'm, I'm a lot more lively, a lot more happy. And it, it shows the true self of like who I want to be. And uh, if people can't handle those natures to where they be become, you know, violent, to where they become over excessive in their drinking, to where they can't handle the alcohol because they don't know temperance versus tolerance, then I would highly recommend not to drink, you know. If you think that you need to drink grape juice during communion, then do it. If you need to drink wine during communion, have at it. Because everything here on earth is just a shadow of the things up in heaven. And everything that is a shadow down here, in one way, in one sense, in one form or another, is corrupted. And I think that's what alcohol is. It's a shadow of the intoxic the intoxication we will get up in heaven the joy that the infusement of the holy spirit but since it's not the holy spirit and it's kind of this fake uh not real thing it'll give us a masking of it but if we use it too much because it is a shadow of that it will be corrupted just like anything we do down here um you know, if we start delving too deeply into promiscuous sex, you know, if we don't stick to just the unification of the husband and the wife in uh, marital um, lovemaking, you know, the way I could put it, uh, then we fall into the depravity of sexual indulgences and pornography and lustful addictions and stuff like that. If we eat too much <clears throat> and we don't um, take heed to the things that we're putting into our mouth if we and you know just if you eat a whole cheesecake i mean chances are you're not going to look like stallone or schwarzenegger okay it's you <laughs> i mean you need to be cautious of the things you're taking into your system again you need to know temperance versus tolerance and uh i, I love going out with the wife and having a drink or two i love going out and with her and going to the lounge and having a, a pipe smoke or a cigar smoke Again, I don't encourage cigarettes because that goes into your lungs. It causes cancer and it's full of nicotine and chemicals and additives and it's horrible for you. But if you're using it as an aromatic, just to light it up, get the tobacco going, breathe it in, blow it out, um, and just have it smell nice and wonderful. I, I really like those scents. Uh, I'm not one who believes in secondhand smoke. I, I think that's just, there's no... There's no proof of that whatsoever scientifically. And I'm going off on a tangent again, but I'm trying to show you the differences of indulgences and how certain people believe that why they think wine is more appropriate for communion than grape juice. And even though it is, I mean, alcohol does cleanse too. Okay, let's let's just be honest. It It, it is in a sense, does purify the body of certain ailments, but if you start drinking it too much, then you become a drunkard, you become an alcoholic. There's, you know, there's, there are ailments that come with it if you do too much. Again, temperance versus tolerance, okay? So this is why I'm one who believes that if you want to take wine during communion or if you want to take grape juice during, during communion, either or is, is fine. There's, there's no specification on what you should and shouldn't do. And I think there's too many rules that come into play with this. If you look at Noah, when he was supposed to be pure in God's eyes. And like I said in the previous episode, pure could have been, he wasn't corrupted by all this sexual activity that was going on with the Nephilim. Uh, I mean, with the angels that came down and had sex with women producing the Nephilim. Uh, his family was one of the only ones that were, well, the only ones biblically that weren't corrupted by this. So, but even if you believe in the purity that he was, you know, pure and sinless, which isn't true because God said everyone has sinned. This includes Noah. Um, that after the flood, he either brought wine with him on the ark or he built his own vineyards, which the Bible said apparently he did. He built his own vineyards, he made his own wine, and he got drunk off wine. So it shows that even Noah himself made wine, which had alcohol in it. Um, and he overdid it one day, passed out, and his sons found him naked. Okay, so... Yeah, there's, there's, there's such a thing as overindulgence if you have too much to drink. Um, 
using it as a communion wine I don't see is really a bad thing. And again, uh, I'm going back into how these rules and regulations start popping up in different denominations on how to do communion, when to do communion, what things to use communion for or, or with. And it's just, it keeps adding up. And I think this is part three of another reason how Satan loves to discourage people from doing things in a sanctimonious way, in a ceremonial way for the Lord. Um, I don't like using the word religious, but in a sense, it is religious. Um, I don't like the way people say, I'm spiritual, not religious. It's like, well, you know, there are certain things the Lord told us to do that fall into repetition. Certain things like prayer and certain things like communion and the way we speak and declare and decree. And that is, in a sense, a religious activity. Um, and I, I can understand why people say it because they don't want to fall into this... Uh, spirit of religion where everything's about laws you know confinement and rules on how to do stuff and what to do it for and why to do it and how to do it and what things to use and it's just like i get it but there is a certain aspect to uh, a religious life which brings in this humbleness which brings in humility which brings in sort of this this piousness which you need to uh show servitude to the lord and i think religion helps do that in a sense not just spirituality you you fall into this train of thought this way of of doing your activities to show that you're being in servitude to the lord and if you're in servitude to somebody and working for them and doing things for repetition that is this seems kind of in a sense what religion is but the devil loves to come in and corrupt that. And he's been stepping in. And if he can't corrupt it through the uh, onslaught of just IRS, you know, tax codes of laws and rules that people have to follow, <clears throat> then another way he'll come in is to corrupt it. He won't add to it with all these laws. He'll come in to totally corrupt it. And I think this is something I need to bring up now, too, um, since we're just a couple days away from it. And I believe that's what Halloween is. There's been uh, a lot of talk lately about Halloween. Back in the old days, it didn't seem too heavy. It just seemed sort of just this this holiday that it was oh, just ju just for kids. But now we're starting to delve a little deeper into it and understanding um, I don't even want to say it's true meaning because it's not as true meaning. It was a corrupted meaning. It started out as All Hallows Eve. And it's a three day ceremony. This goes into Hallows Eve, uh, Ween being short for like evening. So uh, Halloween is short for All Hallows Eve, which goes into the next day, which is All Saints Day, followed by the third day, All Souls Day. And this was a three-day ceremony where people would dress up uh, as their favorite saints, their, their patron saints, go out, collect these soul cakes, and eat them. <coughs> and the final day, All Souls Day, is where people would dress up as skeletons in remembrance of the dead. But I also think that if you're a Christian, it's, it's probably not the best way to look at it because they're already in heaven. I think it was a dressing up as skeletons in a memento mori style of remember we must all die. This is where we are going. We are going to be corpses. We're going to be dust. And it's good to get your orders and affairs straight and right with the Lord. It was a three-day celebration. And I think from there, the people of dressing up in skeletons somehow got corrupted into, well, let's dress up as demons and let's dress up as monsters and stuff like that to scare away other ghosts. Kind of in the same way that gargoyles were supposed to scare away demons because there's this old superstition i don't even know if it's superstition it might be real where the uglier the demon is the more it will scare away other demons you know so it's like the i have a scarier demon therefore no demons are coming into this house because i have a gargoyle on it and it's freaking them out and having them run away i don't know if that's a superstition because i mean Theologically, I, I suppose demons would already do that to each other. There's 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 a hierarchy form, but they they hate each other just as much as they hate humans. I mean, they only work together just for their agenda, but they hate each other just the same. So it's like, oh, that's really helping. Um, 
I can't be either for or against gargoyles. I'm, I'm not sure how to look at that aspect. I, I think maybe posting angels outside the door, statues of angels, would be a little bit more significant in scaring away demons and other demons would. But I, I think the same thing falls in place with Halloween, where people started to put on demonic and evil garb, and the uglier you got, the more you scared away these creatures. It's instead of just dressing up as saints or dressing up as like angelic forms or dressing up in glorification of God and celebration to him and his kingdom and his majesty and his power and the people that were um, brought up and raised to be Christians and their lives as saints, you know, being holy, uh, being holy before the Lord. You'd think that that would maybe, if you dressed up like that, you know, scare away the demons then. Uh, <clears throat> but I think Satan has come in and corrupted Halloween in that sense, to where it started as a Christian holiday, this three-day festival of All Hallows' Eve, All Saints' Day, and then All Souls' Day. And it, it just, it warped into this monstrous thing where we now have kids dressing up as demons and stuff. And I can't say that I'm really for that. I used to be back in the day. I used to love Halloween. Um, I, I still kind of do because I love fall. And I'm still a goth at heart. I, I like all things dark. I, I like I like fall time. And I like rain. And I like the night. And I like stars. And I like mist. And I like fog. I don't like the sun. And you're not going to see me in the Bahamas for a honeymoon. Okay? It's I, I've, I'm going to go to Alaska where there's snow and mountains. <laughs> I'm just, I'm that type of person. I like the more darker, somber things in life. And so does my wife. And a lot of people look at that and go, that's evil. It's like, it's all God. God created all this. He created cats, bats, and the owls. He created the weather. He created fog. He created fall. He created storms. He created rain. He created night, the moon. He created all that stuff. None of that is Satan's. Nothing. Not even the darkness. Satan does not own the darkness. God created the darkness. It's his. He owns everything. And there are certain aspects to what he created that I like. It takes on a bit more of a somber tone, yes. And I know we're supposed to be children of light. And we're supposed to, supposed to act accordingly to that. But those are the things that I like. I like the smell of burning chimney smoke, you know, in, in the fall evenings. That smell is just amazing. You know, I love the smell of pipe tobacco. I, I love earthy tones, uh, especially if I could get that in a nice Melbeck. You know, there's certain things that I like, which other Christians may seem as dark, but they need to realize that this is all God's creation. And we need to stop giving things to Satan. I remember, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a little phlegm in the throat. I remember Robin Bullock's daughter, Christine Bullock? No, Chrissa? Chris or Christine. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm messing up your name. Um, I remember watching Elijah streams and you go, or, or Elijah Fire maybe, and you're going into Halloween and say, oh, we shouldn't be doing this and we shouldn't be, you know, promoting Satanism and stuff like that. And and she brought up something which I thought was kind of interesting. And I might as well say this because my church is doing it. Other churches are doing it. And it's just something that I, I think I should come out and say. Is that I don't understand why kids need to dress up on Halloween that day and dispense candy. You could do that any time of the year. Why don't you stop and, you know, just don't do it that day. And I'm just like, that doesn't make sense, though. All right. Is God against candy? No. As far as from what I hear Cat Care say, he loves candy. He's, he's all about candy. Uh, is he against kids dressing up? You know, well, if it's a demon and stuff like that, yeah, okay. I can say I'm going to lather myself in fake blood and go around and scare people. It's like, okay, maybe that's sort of drawn the line. Dressing up as a cowboy, dressing up as a princess, dressing up as, you know, a saint, you know, you're, or you're dressing up as an astronaut or dressing up as, you know, I'm going to go as a bear or something. Is, is, is any of that evil in and of itself? No. Okay. All right. So... So we got candy, we got dressing up, uh, we got fall, which I like. God created fall. There's nothing wrong at that particular time to go off and do it. So why are we not doing it on Halloween? Well, because it's Satan's day. Well, technically, no, it's not Satan's day. It was all Hallow's Eve. That was a Christian holiday. Satan came in and corrupted it. So you're saying you can do this. You can have a fall festivity. You can dispense candy. You can have games. You can bob for apples and they could come dressed up as, you know, within reason, dressed up in costumes, right? Yes. But you're not going to do it on Halloween. No. Why? Because of Satan's Day. No, it's not. Well, we're not going to do anything on that day because we don't want to give Satan that day. It's like, but you're giving Satan that day by not doing anything. Do you understand? Do you, do you follow my logic? You think that Satan has the power on that day, so you're not going to go out on that day and do stuff because you think that Satan has control over that day. But he doesn't have control over that day. Don't give him that day. Take it back. 
We are taking back Halloween. We are taking back Hallow's Eve. We're taking back All Saints Day. We're taking back All Souls Day in the name of God. This is our day. This is not Satan's day. He has no control over this day. He never had control over that day, ever. There's nothing wrong with kids going out, dressing up as saints, dressing up as like something they want to be, dressing up as like, you know, I mean, unless you're a furry or something, I'm not going to even get into that, but dressing up as, you know, creatures, anything of God's creation, going out, collecting candy, going out and celebrating and having a nice day. There's nothing wrong with that. You need to stop giving those days to Satan because Satan, whether you believe it or not, will take any holiday and try and corrupt it. I've heard from that Rebecca brown book that i have he came to set the captives free he has black masses on easter and christmas where he kills people well he has other people kill people apparently he can't do it on those days i don't know i'm not going to get into a long tangent on that but he has black masses where he does his own sacrifices on those days have we stopped christmas have we stopped easter because satan's trying to take those days no why because he hasn't corrupted those days and he hasn't added in so many rules to it that people uh overindulge in such a way that they themselves corrupt the holiday by adding in all those laws, you know, and like rules and how to's on those holidays. Um, <clears throat> so I think we need to take certain days back from Satan. And another thing that he tries to do, if he can't uh, wreck it through laws and rules and codes, and he can't corrupt it through throwing in his own evil tactics, he'll try and remove it altogether. I would say YouTube, um, the holiday Mikkelmas, which is at the end of September, right right before October begins, um, it used to be a big holiday. All the founding fathers talked about it. It was it was a mass massive day where you uh, supposed to celebrate Saint Michael and his battle over Satan, his defeating Satan, and it's a day that you tie your all all your affairs together and celebrate, or you fast in reconciliation of what you had that year. If it was not a good year, if there's something that was bothering you, you pray on that day and fast on that day and you know try try and get everything together before the fall hits you know and the long winter seeks in it's where you're you're praying and fasting or or celebrating depending on the circumstances that you had and i believe there's many celebrations and events that satan had removed because he couldn't corrupt them and he couldn't add to them you see what i'm saying you couldn't add to and and just warp it to make it a a spirit of religion over it and I think there's many events and many celebrations, many festivities. A lot of things were removed because people think, well, there's too many celebrations on the calendar. I mean, if God is a God who goes off of events and not time, as far as I'm concerned, you can never have enough event. You can never have enough events. You can never have enough celebrations, stuff like that, or festivities or festivals or, or days of, if you will. And... <clears throat> So there's the three tactics that Satan is trying to do within religion, within Christendom, that he tries to wreck itself by either, you know, adding to uh, with laws or corrupting of, you know, by saying it was pagan, which if you look back in the old days, uh, you know, they, they say it was brought in. Oh, this was brought in from pagan superstition or pagan religion that Christians just added to it. And when you get down to the bare bones and you really study, you just don't go off YouTube, but you really start reading the books. There's no fact in that whatsoever. There's no, you, you can't find a lot of it has no truth to it. Now, there's certain things that a lot of people like to comment on in saying that, um, take for instance, the Zodiac. It's like, well, the Zodiac was Babylonian. Um, if you read Chuck Missler's, I believe it's called Signs in the Heavens, if I'm not mistaken, he goes in and explains how the, astro the astrological symbols were actually of uh, Christian origin or at least Judeo, you know, back in the times of the Israelis, they, they would look to the stars to tell a story of the creation and uh, even the story of the Bible, if you will, like Leo the lion, you know, Virgo the virgin, it's the two fishes with Pisces. Um, it's telling a whole story about creation and the Babylonian system came in and corrupted that. A lot of people like to do this with everything Christian. And I've noticed this in videos, and here's something that you could always bring up to them, is that they're like, well, Christian, you know, this this this, this is Christian, but uh, it actually started, you know, in Babylonian times, or it started in Egyptian times, or Sumerian times, or it started in Roman times, so it's older than, you know, predates Christianity. It's like, you got a problem with that, because then if you go back farther, 
who was captives during all of these people who was who were slaves in Egypt who were slaves in Babylon who were slaves in the Roman Empire it's like it was the Jews they had their own fables their own tales their own stories about creation about the coming of this Messiah and it could be just as likely that the Babylonians the Egyptians and the Romans stole those stories from the Jewish people and incorporated it into their system they corrupted it and then the true story came true from what the Israelis were saying before those Babylonian Roman empires and the Egyptians came and corrupted their stories you see what I'm saying so the devil always loves a corrupt he loves a corrupt all sorts of different things and I think one of the things he's trying to do here is to mix in a form of religion a spirit of religion to communion what you can and can't do when you should do this how you should do this what you should use uh, the third aspect that I am going to go into which I'd, sorry for the long tangent in between one and two so let me recap for you the first reason we do it is to do it in remembrance of Jesus for what he did for us the second is for anticipation of what he is going to be doing when he's going to be coming back and drinking a new wine with us and setting up the new kingdom and the third reason is for self-reflection we are taking the blood and body of Christ this is for remembrance of him for what he did for us but we're taking the blood which covers all our sins we're taking the body too as we are incorporated into the body of Christ and we need to take this in self-reflection of ourselves too if we have any sins if we have any troubles if we have any anger issues if we have any wrongdoings or we have something against somebody else take it to the Lord or take it to that person forgive them or take it to the Lord and say Lord please forgive me for these actions before taking this it is a self-reflection and a remembrance of what he has done for us and how we should act in accordance to what he has done for us and now we being as part of the body of Christ need to get all of these issues out of our system before we partake in this and this is why I try and do this communion every day is because man every day I need it <laughs> every day is a fight every day is a struggle and we need to focus on the main reason why the Lord did this and I think this is a triangle thing where the two bottom looking in anticipation to what he's going to do and the self-reflection come to a pivotal peak at the apex which is do it in remembrance of him he said it twice do this in remembrance of me and I think whether you take it once a year or ha every half year or every month or every week or every day is irrelevant just as long as you remember to take it in remembrance of him and you do that by following it through to his sacrifice the anticipation of what he is going to be doing and the self-reflection of how we are supposed to be in accordance to his will and the will of God and to clean us out to purify us we ask that God forgive us of our sins of our transgressions which is what I'm going to do now Lord forgive me my sins my transgressions help me remember what you did for us and it's it's sad for me because I think that's the hardest part and I sometimes I feel like I'm not a true Christian because I see all these people raising hands and they're joyous and they're in praise and they're they're happy and they're they're living in anticipation and it almost feels like I don't have that within me um, like I don't have that joy like I don't have you know the remembrance of what the Lord did for us I know what he did for us it's just I it's like the past few years have been such a turned me into such a shell it's like I just don't feel it anymore and I'm looking to the anticipation of when we will get the glorification of the Holy Spirit within us and I hope that when we take communion whether it's wine or whether it's grape juice that the transubstantiation of the Holy Spirit as Jesus did at the wedding in Canaan would be infused within this and we will get a portion of that until we can drink it fully with the Lord in his kingdom or until we get the glorification imparted to us in this kingdom age on earth as it is in heaven I guess they say so maybe it will be that 
maybe when he comes to raise the dead, as I said in the second episode, and the glory falls upon us, we will have that wine where we will be able to partake it with him. Or when we get raptured up and we meet him in the clouds to be with the wedding feast, that is when he will drink it with us again. I don't know. I'm not sure when that day is. There's still a lot of speculation. Some people may think I'm crazy on my own thoughts and theories as to what this is, which are relatively new within the last couple of years of hearing these prophets and what is happening these days. I used to be one that thought, oh, we just get raptured up and that's the end of it. We're going to be out of here soon. But it seems that the Lord has a lot, a lot more work for us to do. So I guess we'll just wait and see what exactly is going to fall through with that. Until then, we try and take communion as much as we can in remembrance of him. As I said, do it to your own, your own tyings to your congregation or to how you live your life. If you do it every day, that's great. If you do it whenever, just as long as you do it in remembrance of him. I believe that is what counts. That is the reason why we take communion. And Lord, forgive us of our sins. Please give us the glorification of this wine and this body broken, which you should break in remembrance that he was broken for us. So. And we take the wine. Sorry, you keep hearing beeps. I have Telegram up, and my friend Naomi Zeip, her mom, Caroline, keeps, <laughs> she's got, does like 10 posts a day, keeps popping up. So maybe scold your mom in that, Naomi. Be like, tone it down a bit. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, I think before the series ends, I will move to wine. I want to go to that store. I'll see if I can go to it today or tomorrow sometime this weekend and buy some. For those of you who are in the Boise area, I believe it's called Riley's Christian. Um, it's just a Christian store. You can buy all sorts of stuff there. It's, it's off of um, Vista, kind of right down the road from uh, Das Alpenhaus, where I buy my beer. So... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be checking that out probably next time I go to Das Alpenhaus, go there, pick up some actual Eucharist communion wafers, like the bigger ones that I've always wanted to have because those little dinky ones are interesting. Uh, and as for the body of Christ, I should probably just throw this in before I end as well, too, is that uh, it's supposed to be unleavened bread. There's a lot of churches I go to. It's like, we got gluten-free bread, and it's all puffed up and stuff. It's like, well, you shouldn't really add yeast to it because that's the... That's supposed to symbolize the puffing up the pride of man. You're supposed to have flatbread. I mean, you know, take take the wafer, take Jewish flatbread, get yourself a tortilla. I mean, just something, anything that symbolizes, you know, the unpuffing, the unpridefulness of man, like our humbleness to the Lord. Uh, so I saw the gluten-free at the church I go to right now. I don't think that one was puffed up. I've been to churches where I think they literally just take a loaf and cut it up. <laughs> Like, guys, man, you got to be, be a little bit more into the symbolism. There's reasons why they do it that way. So uh, uh, maybe I'll take communion again tomorrow at my congregation if I can make it to church. I was I woke up late last week. Sorry, guys, for those of you who are watching, I wasn't able to make it. I just I was so completely out of it. I overslept and just didn't have time to get up and get ready and go. But I'll try again and partake in communion with the family, with the brothers and sisters within my congregation then. And I hope you all do too. If not, you're welcome to take it here with me. This is why I do it. For those of you who can't get out or for those of you who, you know, go to a church where they do it on particular days and you missed it, um, if you're welcome to take it here and you just replay and take it if you want to. <laughs> so my book recommendation <coughs> today is another a lighthearted funny one. Do I got a piece of fuzz? No, I guess not. Um, a lighthearted funny one. It was uh, kind of like that um, Your Bible and You book that I had the coffee table with a bunch of picture books. This is The Art of Manliness, which is uh, written by Brett and Kate McKay. He's got a site too called The Art of Manliness. I highly recommend you guys go there. And though it's not uh, biblical per se, you know, it's not the, th the whole primary focus on it is not just biblical, but it's about, you know, being a man's man and, you know, trying to do things in the old manly manner, if you will, um, in a non, dare I say, toxic masculinity way. I don't want to start speaking woke and stuff like that. I don't believe in toxic masculinity. Actually, no, I, I do. 
if you think that being a man is, you know, you have to shout the Lord, as uh, Mark Driscoll said, you know, shout the Lord loudest and fart the stinkiest and, you know, belch, belch the hardest and all this stuff. It's, that's, that's not what a man is. That's not just being a complete grunting, farting blob. You know, it's like taking responsibility, being a man, so, you know, putting on the big boy pants, getting stuff done, you know, being the leader of the household, praying for the household, being, you know, strong within your faith. That's, that's honing in on what being a man is. And that book, even though it's truthful, or, or slightly comical, is, is a good read. As you can see, the dapper gent up on the front. It's, I love the clothes. I want to get a suit like that. That would be great. I'm almost there. I think I just need the jacket, don't I? Like that. That's another shirt from the father-in-law, which he gave me. Get hand-me-downs from him. It's really weird, but it's a very Burton-esque kind of shirt. I like that one. So, um, oh, my recommendation for this week for the online person, <laughs> for the online prophet, or the recommendation I have, I'm going to recommend Amanda Grace Ministries to you. Um, she, wow. Did she go into one just a few days ago? I, I feel like I should almost put up that particular message. I, I want to give her whole site, but there's a particular message that she just did just like recently, like yesterday, I think, or maybe the day before, but it goes in deep, long and hard. And if I send you that link, you can watch that and then you'd be able to, from the YouTube site, just click on, you know, her, her site and they can watch any of her other videos. So I, I don't think I'll give just her basic broad page where you could click on any video. I think specifically for this video, I want to go in and have you watch this one that she speaks of because it's hardcore and it's, it goes in deep and hard and, uh, it shows you just how strong some of these prophets are in the word of the Lord and how just. I mean, just wild it's going to get from here on out. And a lot of her prophecies, like Julie Green, a lot of her prophecies have come to pass already. I mean, just like, you know, Johnny on the spot. Uh, actually, is that the way? Is that the best way to say it? Not instantaneously. Sorry. I, I meant the way she said it and it actually happening is like just, it, it's not a coincidence. Like it happened. She said it, it happened type stuff. So really impressive. Um, go check it out. And I know this uh, tangent, more of, more of a tangent than an episode, was sort of everywhere this week. I sort of wanted to tie it all in and express to you exactly how the devil works and what he's trying to do with the spirit of religion to come in and change things, either through just with rules and laws and regulations and content this and content that, and you can't do it this way and this is wrong and you can't do it, this that's incorrect. You know, you need to follow this way or it's just like we're going to corrupt it and hogwash it with so much garbage and satanic stuff and paganism that it gets to the point that it's no longer a Christian service anymore. It's no longer a Christian holiday. We're going to take it and corrupt it to the point that people just want to shut it down and just completely remove it or just flat out remove it. You know, like they have it removed from the calendars, have it removed from the systems, not remember it at all, not remember the reason why we start up the holiday or the event. <clears throat> He's trying to get us off the focal points of events, off sacraments, off doing things in a religious purpose or a religious celebration or a holiday or an event, because that's how God works. He doesn't work in a timeline. He doesn't work in time frames. He works in events. And Satan loves to just wreck it in any way, shape or form he can. And I believe one of them that he tried to do was the reason for communion and why so many people are arguing and fighting about it. We still do it, but we have our discrepancies. You know, well, you shouldn't do wine. Well, you're doing grape juice. That's not correct. Well, you're doing this. It's like, oh, you got to do it at this time or you got to do it for this reason. or You got to do it at this hour. It's like, stop having the spirit of religion over communion and just remember why you're doing it. And pretty much the only reason why you should do it. And that is in remembrance of him, whether you believe in transubstantiation or the imbibing of the Holy Spirit into uh, how, how it incorporates into the wine and, it, and into the blood. Or if you're just taking in remembrance of him, it's with grape juice and some wafers, you know, that's the whole focal point is why you are taking it. And that is for remembering what Jesus did for you. And I think we need to hone in on that and all the rules and regulations of how, cause he never said how, just do it. So do it that way. <laughs> There's my rule and regulation for you. So I guess that's it. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. And I hope I got through to some people on 
just removing that spirit of religion over them is not a bad thing to have religious practices within your life if you're doing it to humble yourself to show up servitude to the lord but if you're giving rules and regulations and and all these uh religious manners of how things are done or or removal of of something because it was uh, so washed out with um things that we see as evil and as bad but many things are of god's creation and we need to just remove the evilness that satan is trying to incorporate into these sacraments into these holidays and events and and try and remember certain holidays as well of why we do them I, I feel this just came to me right now i also feel that thanksgiving is another one of these events another one of these holidays which satan is trying to really hard to remove and the reasons why we have thanksgiving and how our nation still in a sense has it but it's been so washed down it's been you don't see any thanksgiving like statues of pilgrims and indians anymore thanks thanksgiving cards or you know thanksgiving ornaments or anything to hang around the house it's almost been like it's been completely wiped out and removed from our culture we need to hold fast to that again remember why we have it we need to hold to the reasons on why we do communion why we have certain activities and holidays and bring it back to you lord not just expel it out because we think it's evil or satanic but bring it back call it in and say it is our satan cannot have it it is not his to have it never was his to have we need to bring that back to us in jesus name i pray amen well that is it for now i got a long busy weekend i still got to clean the house in about an hour to do it so because we're going to be taking off again very busy day about three or four things going down so i'll try and finish this up if it's not out today you'll probably see this out on sunday so i guess that's it i'll talk to you later take care i love you stay strong in the lord bye <music>